introduction. I'd also like to thank uh, Christina and the Ultra High Field team uh, for the invitation and for organizing this workshop. Very happy to be here. Uh, so I've been asked today to speak about uh, functional connectivity. Uh, it's a topic I've been thinking about a lot lately, so I'm very happy to have this opportunity. So let's see. Uh, great. So most of the work in our group falls under the general theme of developing high space to type of resolution fMRI for improving neuronal specificity. So along these lines, uh, recently we presented at the Dubrovnik Ultra High Field Workshop uh, a new uh, method for whole field of view high resolution bold at 7 Tesla, known as VFA Fleet. Here's an example of some 0.6 millimeter isotropic fMRI that we're using now uh, to sample fine scale structures in the human brain. Uh, we've also investigated fine scale functional architecture using cortical columns uh, in primary visual cortex, the classic ocular dominance column system, and the extra stripe visual cortex, uh, the classic uh, thick thin pale stripe system. We're, of course, not the first group to be looking at these systems, and I think that perhaps Camille will show us some prior work later today from the CMRR. Uh, so let's see, we've also been investigating laminar or cortical depth dependent fMRI responses, including this early work looking at cortical depth dependence of spatial accuracy in Bolt, uh, Grady Nickel Bolt. Recently, we've also been exploring the temporal resolution limits of fMRI, um, looking at using fast fMRI to detect rapidly oscillating stimulus-driven oscillations uh, in fMRI. So in keeping with this theme, today I'd like to talk about improving neuronal specificity of fMRI in the context of resting state functional connectivity. So in this presentation, I'll go through three recent studies. Uh, first, I'll show some work looking at physiological resting state networks. And there I'll ask the question, can we differentiate between neural networks from structured physiological noise? Next, I'd like to show some recent data looking at cortical orientation dependence in bold fMRI. And there I'll ask the question, does cortical geometry impart detection biases in our cross-subject variants? And I'll end by showing recent work using a collaboration from Randy Buckner's group, uh, looking at the, the fractionation of the default mode network, as well as other well-known global functional networks. And there I'll ask, how can single subject analyses help us to improve the delineation of these networks? So first, physiological resting state networks. Uh, slow changes in systemic brain physiology can elicit large bold fluctuations. Uh, previous studies have shown that large components of the bold signal can be driven by uh, the respiration volume, heart rate variability, as well as entitled CO2 and other systemic changes in uh, physiology, including blood pressure dynamics. Now, slow changes in systemic brain physiology can confound resting state functional connectivity. Uh, recent work from Kitty Jang's group nicely demonstrated how when the connectivity within the default mode is estimated from a period of regular breathing, uh, the connectivity pattern looks as we would expect, uh, strongly resembles the default mode network. However, when the same connectivity is estimated from a period including even a single deep breath, uh, the connectivity pattern is substantially altered. So often, uh, these physiological components of resting state are identified through their spatial patterns. However, few studies have examined the regional variability of the bold physiology. Um, so instantaneous fluctuations have been shown to be localized within large veins, and some components of the resting state signal are thought to be global and spatially invariant, uh, therefore are unlikely to contribute to apparent connectivity estimates. Now, a few studies have examined this regional variability. Conventionally, uh, the bold response to these physiological signals is viewed as globally similar and modeled by a single canonical physiological response function, including the responses to entitled CO2 changes, uh, the cardiac signal, as well as the respiratory response. However, we might expect that uh, these responses to be spatially varying because, for example, it's well known that the blood arrival time is inconsistent across the brain, has a large spatial variation, as well as we know that there's strong heterogeneity of the vascular anatomy across the cortex as well as the brain. Therefore, we reasoned that these physiological responses may differ in timing and in amplitudes across different brain regions. So to test this, we deconvolved externally recorded slow physiological changes from resting state bold at every voxel. Uh, we leveraged the large numbers of subjects provided by the Human Connectome Project data set, uh, in this case, 190 subjects acquired at three Tesla, after correcting for instantaneous physiological noise using retro i -core. So here are the results. Uh, this analysis applied to the respiratory signal, essentially a per voxel respiration response or a 4D uh, respiration response function that varies over space and time. So while there were some differences of the signals across uh, subjects, the patterns were largely consistent. And the average time courses shown above exhibited uh, some strong uh, variability across the brain. You can also see in the movie in the bottom that we see that uh, the amplitude and timing of this response varies dramatically across the brain. So then we, we then performed a data-driven clustering analysis to identify regions with similar respiratory responses. And we indeed pulled out strong uh, regional differences in the respiratory response across individuals, and below are the mean responses within each of these uh, clusters. 
So note that some of these clusterings really strongly resemble patterns we typically see in functional connectivity analysis that could be mistaken for neuronal networks. Uh, this suggests that correlation analyses, which are standard, may detect patterns that are purely driven by similarities in the respiratory response, uh, which we call respiratory networks. We then perform the same deconvolution of slow change in the heart rate signal to estimate a per voxel cardiac response function. Again, the responses were largely uh, consistent across subjects, showing a spatially varying amplitude and timing of this 4D bold cardiac response function across the brain. And again, a data-driven clustering analysis revealed several clusterings that resemble neuronal networks, and thus again could be potentially mistaken for neural networks in standard functional connectivity analyses. So to test for the similarity between physiological networks and conventional resting state networks, we compared this uh, respiratory connectivity to spontaneous functional connectivity. We did this by generating uh, two bold data sets. Uh, the first was a synthesized data set containing only respiratory driven dynamics by convolving these group averaged uh, voxel wise respiratory response functions with recorded respiratory uh, waveforms from each HCP subject uh, labeled as RESP. Uh, the other data set consisted of resting state bold after careful removal of all physiological fluctuations, uh, including those changes associated with slow respiratory and cardiac signals uh, that we used to derive our response functions. This is our best estimate of bold data without any physiological noise representing uh, neuronal fluctuations. And then we performed a seed-based functional connectivity for each of these data sets. We saw that when using a seed from the visual network, we saw that the correlations observed in the synthetic data, again, containing only respiratory driven dynamics, uh, closely resembled the correlations in, in the denoised data, containing hopefully mostly neuronal fluctuations. We saw similar resemblance in the connectivity estimated from the dorsal PCC as a seed. We've repeated the same analysis after regressing out the global signal, which is often used to remove systemic physiological fluctuations from resting state data, however, which does not account for regional differences in physiological responses. Again, we saw strong similarities between the respiratory connectivity and the spontaneous functional connectivity. So what does this mean? Um, so the physiological networks here seem to mimic the neuronal networks. Uh, the, the, while this observation is robust, the interpretation right now is not very clear. It may just be that we're seeing some relationship between regional vascular anatomy or physiology with the underlying cortical areas and recent intriguing data from Molly Bright and Kevin Murphy, who I think I saw, oh, Kevin, um, further suggests that the vascular anatomy in some ways may reflect the underlying neuronal function. I think this is a, a cool hypothesis, which is, I think, consistent with these results. Uh, so next, I'd like to talk about cortical orientation dependence of old fMRI. And so this is work by Olivia Wiesman, who is uh, working in our, our group now. So, and she's in the audience today, I believe. And so if you have any questions, want to hear more about this work, I encourage you to contact Olivia. So as voxels get smaller, we have to be mindful of the influence of the vascular geometry on bold fMRI. We know that the cortical vasculature follows a strict geometry with large pia vessels lying tangentially on the surface and diving arterioles and ascending venules penetrating perpendicularly through the cortex. What this means is that there's a coupling between the cortical geometry and the vascular geometry. Now, what's well known classically is the bolt signal exhibits the dependence on vessel orientation, uh, shown by this equation here and illustrated by this animation. So as we go to higher field strengths, most of the bolt signal is extravascular. So what this means is that if a blood vessel is oriented uh, parallel to the direction of the main magnetic field, the extravascular field around this vessel is minimized, and therefore we see very little bolt signal. In fact, most vessels that are oriented parallel to the main magnetic field are basically invisible to our studies. We compare this to vessels that are oriented perpendicularly to the magnetic field. There, the extravascular fields are maximized, we see a very strong bold response. Now, while this effect is very well known, this uh, vessel orientation is usually neglected in conventional studies. That's because I think for large voxels, we can typically assume that every voxel contains a random distribution of orientations. Now, although this vessel uh, orientation of a single vessel is well known, a uh, recent work by Louis Gagnon and David Boas's lab using microvascular reconstructions of the mouse uh, cortex quantified through simulations uh, this orientation effect expected from a voxel uh, containing realistic microvascular geometry. And while there is perhaps no surprise that some effect existed, their simulation has predicted a 40% effect. They predicted that places where uh, the cortex was oriented parallel to the main magnetic field, the bolt signal change would be 40% larger than places where the cortex was oriented perpendicularly to the magnetic field. This is somewhat surprising, but then they went down to a conventional 3D scanner, and they could see using a whole brain activation, using a CO2 delivery, they could see in the conventional 3D data uh, similar effect size compared to their simulations. <clears throat> 
So this is sort of a striking effect, and we wanted to see to what extent this would be detected in resting state fMRI data as well, and also to see whether it varied across cortical depths. And indeed, in our seven Tesla data, we saw that the bolt fluctuation am amplitude uh, is a function of cortical orientation and does vary. This effect does vary across cortical depths. So here's an example. If we look at voxel sampling near to the PL surface, if we compare the bold fluctuation amplitudes measured in locations where the cortex is oriented parallel to B0, we see that the fluctuation amplitudes are 70% larger compared to locations where the cortex is perpendicular to B0. Now, this is a strong effect. This is from voxel sampling from the PL surface. As Olivia sort of considered voxels pushed deeper and deeper into the gray matter, we saw that this effect sort of slowly melted away. It almost vanished near to the white matter surface. We still see about a 10% effect from voxel sampling close to the white matter surface. But then something interesting happened. So Olivia considered voxels that are sort of touching the gray matter-white matter border and kind of pushed into the superficial white matter. And the effect rebounded. So again, this observed effect we're seeing here is consistent with some influence of vessels running tangential to the cortical surface, but here it's seen a voxel sampling very far away from the peel surface. So at first we thought there might be something going wrong with our analysis, but then I think Olivia remembered uh, classic descriptions of large veins within the superficial white matter running uh, tangentially to and hugging the gray-white border. And we think it's this network of vessels that's causing uh, this effect that we see in our data. Uh, so to summarize, we see orientation effects in resting state bolt fluctuations. I showed you at 7 Tesla. We see these at 3 Tesla as well. Uh, these vary with cortical depth from the peel surface to the superficial white matter as voxels are sampling from different levels of the vascular hierarchy. Now, this effect uh, varies with voxel size. Uh, the, the effect varies across field strengths due to different intravascular and extravascular contributions with field strengths. Now, note this is a pretty sizable bias that we're seeing here, but the good news is that it's a function of cortical orientation, which is easy to estimate. So we think that this will be straightforward to correct and further clean up our data to achieve higher neuronal specificity. Also, I think another useful um, feature of this is that it can potentially provide us with information about the vascular contributions uh, to candidate bold fMRI acquisition techniques. Now, we're also seeing this orientation effect in high-quality modern data sets, such as that provided by the Human Connectome Project. Here we saw at the 3 Tesla, there was a 20% orientation bias in the 3 Tesla resting state fMRI data. And just to get a sense for whether this effect would exist in data that was kind of conventionally pre-processed, we also aggressively smoothed this data to, with a 5 millimeter kernel. We could still see a strong orientation effect. So then we wanted to see if uh, cross-subject orientation variability may be the cause of a cross-subject TSNR variability. So here Olivia generated a map of sort of orientation atlas across 110 uh, uh, HCP subjects or uh, orientation dispersion. So in places where um, the, 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 the bright colors, these are places where the cortical orientation is sort of less variable across individuals, and the dark regions are places where the cortical orientation was more variable across individuals. Uh, note that these dark regions happen to overlap with association cortex, which we'll come back to later. So then we kind of correlated or looked at the association between this cross-subject orientation dispersion with a cross-subject variance in time series SNR. And we saw that indeed the orientation dispersion could account for a sizable variance of the cross-subject uh, variability in, in time series SNR. So this orientation effect appears to be both a source of inter-individual bias as well as a, a source of group level variability. Now we're just beginning to test whether this impacts functional connectivity estimates, although for this, we have to be careful uh, because those brilliant regions, as I pointed out, that are more variable across subjects appear to be in regions of association cortex, uh, which is known to have true intersubject variability in functional organization and connectivity patterns, uh, which brings me to the last topic I want to pre uh, present on the fractionation of the default mode network. Now, it's well known there's a great deal of uh, variability in both brain anatomy and functional organization across individuals. However, in many studies, especially in cognitive neuroscience, activation patterns from many subjects are averaged together after spatial normalization in order to increase detection power. Unfortunately, due to real and often meaningful differences across individuals, this averaging can often smear out activation across subjects and be the cause of underestimated specificity. Often group level averaging, however, is not required to detect responses, making it possible to map activation at a single subject level. Here are examples of some classic single subject analyses, including a language localizer task, some high level vision, and even a pet study of memory retrieval back to the 90s. They're all able to map individual level responses. Now, because of the high degree of variability uh, across subjects seen in functional connectivity estimates within association cortex, and I mentioned a few slides back, uh, Randy Buckner's group wanted to investigate with high sensitivity uh, the organization of the default network within individual subjects. So if we consider uh, the default mode network uh, identified by Randy's group across a, a thousand subjects a few years back, and leave only the outlines of the nodes in the network and overlay data from one individual, 
and consider functional connectivity resulting from two different seeds here in the lateral prefrontal cortex of the default network. In this case, from data from one subject averaged across 24 MRI sessions, we see that individual subnetworks appear for each seed, and both subnetworks occupy regions within the default mode network. Just toggle back and forth, you can see. So for each subject, the seed placement was optimized to maximize the separation of these two subnetworks. And when these uh, subnetworks uh, disappeared, when the, the seed vertices optimized for one subject were transferred to another subject, uh, suggesting that group level analyses would obfuscate uh, this network fraction they saw on individual subject level. So if I display both networks together, which uh, they named default network A and default network B, you can see that they not only occupy regions of the classic default network, but they're also adjacent, spatially distinct, and interdigitated. Uh, so other group level studies have suggested that the default network may be split into two or three subnetworks, but in those studies, the nodes were contiguous and, and very large, whereas here they clearly exhibit some fine scale structure as well as being interdigitated. So this may complicate the role of uh, the deep nodes of the default network known as hubs of global networks, or maybe this interdigitation could facilitate you know, information transfer that could give rise to these hub-like behavior. Now, these two networks here were identified consistently using both surface-based analysis and volume-based analysis, following best practice uh, methods for high-resolution fMRI analysis. And they can also be seen in individual subjects from a single experimental session at 7 Tesla, showcasing the ability of 7 Tesla to provide sufficient sensitivity for these single-subject fMRI studies. Note that here, every voxel corresponding to default network A is labeled as blue. Every voxel corresponding to default network B is located in... in uh, yellow, and there's just a few regions that correspond to overlaps between these two networks uh, delineated by these uh, pink voxels. So to understand uh, the functional roles of these two networks, Randy's group then presented several tasks of high-level cognition, um, including tests tapping uh, social function and tests tapping memory. They saw that uh, the default network A overlaps strongly with the responses to the memory tasks, and default network B overlaps strongly with the responses to um, social function. So then they performed similar analysis of the frontal parietal control network uh, and the dorsal attention network, which are also located within the association cortex. And again, demonstrated that these networks also have complex interdigitated relationships. However, there appears to be some macro scale gradients of network organization in that the subnetworks exhibit the same kind of general progressions across individuals. And finally, in a recent study, they also identified a new network, uh, another specialized network here, denoted in yellow, which happened to overlap very closely with activation driven by a simple language localizer task. Again, we can see a lot of variability across subjects, uh, but this language network appears to be highly specific to language processing with minimal overlap with other networks. So just to wrap up, as many of you know, um, single subject analysis has been a holy grail of psychiatric imaging, both for diagnosis and for monitoring treatment. Uh, therefore, the ability to map these cognitive functions at the individual level without relying on group averaging, I think is of key importance. So just to conclude, I've shown you how spatially varying structured physiological noise can generate network-like patterns of correlations. Uh, these patterns seem to resemble the vascular anatomy and may reflect to some degree underlying neuronal function. Uh, I think there might be some clinical relevance of these physiological networks for detecting vascular uh, pathology. I think that uh, potentially this may be useful in this emerging subfield of physiological MRI, where often the roles of signal and noise are reversed. I've shown you how cortical vascular geometry imparts orientation biases in bald fMRI, and how it also shows inter-individual differences in the folding pattern are associated uh, with uh, inter-individual variability in TSNR. I've shown you how single subject functional connectivity can reveal interdigitated inter networks. Um, the high sensitivity of 7 Tesla allows for fine scale features of these networks underlying high level cognitive functions detected at the individual level, avoiding the need for group level analyses. Indeed, I think this is one of the main kind of killer apps of ultra field fMRI. And finally, I think that further improvements in resolution as well as sensitivity is going to be required, as well as characterization of the um, physiological and vascular effects to further increase the neuronal specificity of both fMRI and functional connectivity. And with that, I just want to thank a few people for providing me with materials, especially uh, Jigren, uh, Olivia, and of course, Randy Buckner, uh, Rod Braga. Uh, thank our funding sources for their support, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>